this webinar. Uh, I'm Armen Hovakimian. Uh, I'm an AUA alum from the class of 1993, and I'm currently a professor of finance at the City University of New York. I'll be moderating this webinar. A couple of administrative points. Uh, we'll start with a few predetermined questions, and then we'll continue with the questions from the audience. Uh, the webinar will be recorded. Uh, please keep your microphones muted throughout the webinar. Uh, please submit questions using the chat feature of the Zoom, and we will have time to go over those in the second part of the webinar. All right, so the topic of today's webinar is very important and timely. The relationship between um, Armenia and the Armenian diaspora and how to make the most of it. Uh, and our two guests today are uniquely qualified to help us answer this question. Let me introduce them briefly. Uh, uh, Dr. Armand Terkuragan is a Taisa Professor of Civil Engineering Emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Terkuragan had a distinguished academic career in the United States, but more importantly for our today's uh, um, topic discussion, he is one of the founders of the American University of Armenia, uh, which is one of the most successful diaspora projects in Armenia. He has served as the founding dean of the College of Engineering as interim provost and as the president of the UA. He continues to serve as a founding member of the board of trustees of the American University of Armenia Corporation. Our second guest is my friend and classmate from the class of 1993, um, David Hakopen. Uh, David has spent the first 10 years of his professional career as a laser physicist and has a PhD in that field. After graduating from AUA, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, after graduating from AUA with an MBA, he has spent the next 26 years of his professional life at the United Nations. He worked in 15 countries and had senior long-term assignments in Afghanistan, Somalia, and Syria, among others. He has recently retired from the UN and was appointed the first Deputy Chief of Staff of the President of Artsakh and is joining us from Stepanakert. So welcome, Armand. Welcome, David. All right. Thank you. So let me start with questions. So today we are discussing one of those topics that every Armenian think one of those topics about. That... Um, and we could easily you know, ask 7, 10 million people and everybody will have their own take on it. Uh, however, you guys, I think, have some unique experiences which make your views more interesting for the audience. So could you maybe share with us an experience that you think affected your perspective on the relationship between the Armenian diaspora and Armenia? Um, Armen, please, first you. Well, uh, good morning, good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to join you. And uh, thanks to the alumni office uh, for organizing this and to Armen Wakimian for uh, being the person behind over the, the planning uh, of uh, the event. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm uh, certainly happy to uh, join my friend David uh, Akopian was not too far, his family is not too far from where I am. Um, well, uh, I first visited Armenia in 1986 as a guest of the Polytechnic. This is during the Gorbachev time. Uh, during that visit, I observed a vast difference in the way higher education and scientific research was being conducted in the Soviet Armenia versus my experience in the United States. Um, my subsequent visits uh, were shortly after the 1988 earthquake. During the second of these visits in February 1989, I noted that very little serious investigation had been carried out to understand and learn from the immense damage and fatality that had resulted from the earthquake. There was plenty of evidence and data to be used, but reports tried to put the blame on what I would say unusual aspects of the earthquake, um, unusual in quotation, uh, vertical uh, motion was unusually high, uh, that uh, there were just two earthquakes hard and one, one after the other, 
and uh, rather than putting blame on shortcomings in design and construction scientific reasoning in an honest way. I must say, confess that during this time, February 1989, I was deeply frustrated that here we had a major tragedy and scientists were not doing an honest job of under trying to learn and understand from this tragedy. It is during that visit that the idea of establishing a new educational system came about. I must say partly from that frustration. Of course, you know the end result. I don't need to go into details now. But I can say without hesitation that they, and this I'm amplifying what Armen just said, um, I think AUA is the most important contribution that, dias that the Armenian diaspora, particularly the American Armenian diaspora, has made in our homeland. I don't think there is any other um, project that has and will have the impact that AUA will have in Armenia for many, many, uh, for in the entire future. I think AUA also offers a model of, for successful collaboration between the diaspora and Armenia. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about this more in the conversation today. I will stop now and pass it on back to Armin. All right. Yes. So first, thank you really very much for this interesting opportunity to talk to my many friends and unknown people who see my perspective. And we'll start probably from the point Armen Der Kuryaran left, yes. And 30 years after establishing the AUA, here I am after traveling the world and spending, I don't know, the last 20 something years in so many different realities. I'm back and back not just to Armenia, I'm back to Arsakh. So all this discussion, whether we're going to graduate and leave Armenia, in my case, it didn't work exactly the way, although I left and I'm back and I'm here now. I am, I am in Artsakh and Karabakh and working to help to address the crisis now, but also to think about strategically and longer term. A couple of important points which I want to highlight. To me, Artsakh, Armenia and diaspora, this is a trinity. And some people equate Artsakh and Armenia, but and there are in the history of Armenians, there were a number of cases where we had two parallel Armenian states existing together from Tigran the Great time to Cilicia time and many other times also. And there are things which are different here versus Armenia also. And this is even the way the state is constructed. There are nuances which are different. But I'll come to that point a bit later. So for now, just giving my perspective again i'm product of this one of the most successful diaspora projects in armenia and deeply appreciating what our mentor Kuregan, what miran Arbabian, and many others did and for me aua and my engagement with aua was one of these greatest opportunities my son studied at melkonian's school in cyprus another interesting engagement with Melkonian in Cyprus, AGBU in Cyprus. And throughout my UN career, I probably visited at least 50 or 60 different countries. And in half of those countries, I met the diaspora. From Kyrgyzstan to Iran, to Syria, to Lebanon, to France, to US, and different parts of US, New York versus San Francisco, etc. And there is always some very special way to relate to each other probably will come back to this later, but to me, there is certain collegial, collegial spirit of being part of the same and being, let's say, part of the cultures who are, let's say, engaged uh, in our rea realities in our lives. But overall, I want really to mention that this co collective effort of the Armenians around the world is an important, let's say, project which has a long history, but it also has a, an important future, and we probably will reflect about this a bit later also. We'll stop here now. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so let's move on. Um, 
uh, when we talk about the relationship between diaspora and Armenia, we are really talking about the relationships between like seven, 10 million people, depends on the count. And they are spread out all over the world. And they're all very different. Neither the diaspora nor Armenia are homogenous. Um, at the same time, Armenians in different parts of diaspora and in Armenia tend to be exposed to different life and professional experiences. This leads to different densities of certain views, skills, financial resources across these different segments of larger Armenian nation. This variation makes cooperation potentially very fruitful and rewarding, but it can also create uh, frictions and mismatches in what people expect from this kind of relationship. So from your experience, do you have uh, examples of successfully overcoming any you know frictions between you know the diaspora participation and participation from armenia uh armen please yes thank you for the question um indeed there are vast differences in many attributes of people living in armenia versus the, the diaspora but uh, we must understand also that there are vast variations within the diaspora communities. Uh, the Armenian diaspora is spread over many countries, with the community within each country having adopted certain local characteristics. Uh, furthermore, the diaspora Armenians tend to be scattered, fragmented, and ungovernable. There is no umbrella organization that can unify them no elected governing body to plan or execute projects for, in the, for the whole diaspora, and no power to levy taxes. I wish it was possible to tax diaspora and Armenians uh, on behalf of Armenia, but uh, there's no power to do that. As a result, diaspora initiatives are often at the level of individuals or small groups organizations such as HBU, Armenian Relief Society, ARPA, AESA, etc., which engage in relatively small fractions of the diaspora Armenians. If you, even HBU, one of the largest ones, if you think in terms of membership, they don't have membership, but the number of diaspora Armenians that are part of HBU or consider themselves part of HBU, it's a very small fraction of the diaspora Armenians. Uh, as an example, AUA is a uh, result of an initiative by individuals later backed by a GBU. TUMO is the result of an individual initiative, practically an individual, Sam Simonia. And so is Koa, for example, Armen Gara. Um, of course, there's also business initiatives aim that job creation hopefully profit make i don't want to only talk about sort of uh, uh, non-profit uh, institution to address the issue of diversity of diaspora versus armenian experiences and possible mismatch between their expectations in my view uh, several ingredients are essential in my opinion in order for diaspora Armenians to have projects in Armenia, it is essential for them to visit Armenia frequently and for relatively long periods of time. I'm not talking about making one or two week touristic visits going to, from monument to monument and so on. That, they, they, these visits have to be aimed at gaining an understanding of the conditions, norms, and expectations in Armenia, and, and an appreciation for the historical context. We, it, 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 some diasporans go there and just criticize without thinking of the historical context. Uh, the famines in early 20th century, the Republic, and then the Sovietization for 70 years, one has to understand the norms, conditions, expectations in this context. Um, I think starting diaspora projects from a distance 
with a one or two week touristic visit is not likely to produce positive results. Uh, the aspirants who want to do things there must invest the time and effort to visit and understand, uh, locally understand the parameters. Um, and I, the second uh, given, I think, uh, is that there must be local specialists in whatever field this is, the project is, who are engaged with the initiative. I don't think it is possible for diasporans to do things uh, alone by themselves. There is need for collaboration. This is essential for fostering understanding and harmony between the expectations from the diasporans and local norms and possibilities. However, this also raises the risk of abuse and exploitation if the right local individuals are not selected. And we, each of us, know many, many examples uh, of problems that have arisen. Uh, one example is uh, something that benefited AUA, as probably you know, uh, we received two buildings from Nigerians. These buildings were in a big dispute, very, very sorry situation for Nigerians who had invested a lot of time and effort in Armenia and Karabakh, and they were duped by their local contacts. So um, it is very important that these local collaborators be the right people. In the specific case of AUA, there were such local collaborators, and I can mention Yuri Sarkisian, Billy Karachunian, and Sova Kavakian, who played very crucial roles in the early years of the founding of the university and were extremely important in success of the university. <coughs> so the, those two things, I think, are essential um, uh, for a project in order for, for this difference in expectations to be appreciated and overcome. Thank you, Armen. Um, David, please. Yes, first, uh, Armen, thank you, and thank you for remembering my boss, Willy Karuzuni, and I mean, he was my boss in my physics life, uh, and really one of the men I respect deeply. Coming back to the question, I think I want to bring two interactions I had on this subject with, in a very different context. Like a World Bank expert, one of the senior officials in Central Asia, I spoke about different diasporas. He said they have done some studies and Armenian, Jewish, and the Irish diasporas are the ones which keep identity for at least four generations. While usually the diaspora in one or two generations, they, they dilute and lose their identity. And he was trying to understand what is that which keeps us for few generations as pure Armenians. And then there was a reflection on this in Ruben Vartanian's book about Armenia on the crossroad, which I fully shared this approach. And I try later to elaborate in one of the articles I wrote on the subject, which says there is some core set of let's say values or combination of different things which makes us armenian some people are saying genes i don't believe in this gene theory but for me the music the culture the food the the working ethics armenian working ethics in fact is respected in many countries not that much in armenia unfortunately but i mean in many countries i had this interaction in syria kyrgyzstan Uzbekistan, and middle east in general they were saying oh, you armenians are known you are good i mean like tailors you are good doctors you are this you are your, your restaurants are for the best food and stuff like it but there are some known qualities of us as armenians which not always we understand and appreciate and not necessarily we are seeing this in every case in life, but this is the fact from the other's perspective about that. So there is a core which keeps us to identity, as I mean an identity, and on the surface we are very adaptive. Like we learn languages very quickly when we move to another place. And the surface is changing, the core stays the same. And it helps, in fact, in Ruben Vartanian's book, he's speaking about the Silk Road, and how Armenians became the connectors of 
Asia and uh, Europe to on the Silk Road, the main traders, because all Armenians trust each other across the road, across the Silk Road. All Armenians speak the same language. They don't need papers, legal system to trust each other. At the same time, they were the ones facilitating a lot in trade. So this is not there, but this is part of our future, looking on us, how we can recreate the Armenian network, which serves the world and serves also uh, the, the, the global community also. So that's why this effect, the fact that we are so different, that we are the, it's not necessarily that we are diluting in those cultures, we are adapting to those cultures, but we are keeping certain level of identity. And wherever I was, again, from Kashgar in China, from Bishkek or Tashkent or Amman or Damascus or New York or wherever, or Latin America, Buenos Aires, wherever, I mean, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa also. So suddenly you feel that there's something connecting you. I remember once with my daughter, I mean, she's now 21, when we came to Armenia after she has not been there for a couple of years, and she said, why everybody call each other Aperik and Kuirik? Does it mean that all Armenians are relatives to each other? So there is something special which clicks us immediately and easily with each other. And this is an asset of nation which we need to keep. Over. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, okay, so for for the next question, I'm going to ask you to imagine uh, 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 an Armenian in diaspora, okay? Maybe born in diaspora, maybe born in Armenia, maybe even someone who went to school, college, worked in Armenia, but then left and spent most of the sort of professional career abroad. All right. So, uh, and such a person these days, is, you know, I think this is white, very sort of widespread. Everybody wants to get involved more than they used to and wants to be helpful. So people usually, you know, think about themselves, what, what Armenia needs, what they can do. And somewhere on the intersection of that, they come up with something. Um, then they may, you know, some of them get stuck there because they don't know what to do after that. Uh, some of them find some people to talk to uh sort of pitch their ideas and things like that sometimes it works other times you know you get thanks but no thanks type of sort of response so the question is what's your advice what should people do i mean and, and to some extent uh, i went there Kira and already answered this in his previous <laughs> comments but about going to armenia for example and spending a lot of time but are there other things well um you know, uh, diaspora Armenians have uh, good intention. Man, many, many people have very good intentions. And they come up with ideas. Oh, this would be breaking, you know, uh, it would create a job, it, it would do this, that. Uh, um, however, for an initiative from diaspora to be successful in Armenia, it has to respond to a genuine local need. If you cannot find, and I'm, you know, yes, once you have the idea, you've got to go to Armenia. I don't think sitting abroad and imagining and sending emails to Armenia are going to work. You have to go there, you have to interact with the locals. And if you cannot find locals who are interested or excited about your proposed idea, then that is an indication that it does not respond to a genuine need. Forget it. There, there has to be, of course, you want to talk to the right people in Armenia, but if you don't generate enthusiasm about it, I don't think it's something you want to pursue. I also think that serious projects that will make a difference in Armenia will necessarily be life-changing for the diaspora in Armenia. Don't think that you can do it on the side as a small project and have an impact. Once you get invested in it, uh, you will need to put a lot of time and energy to make it happen. I'll just tell you a little story. Uh, in uh, 19, my, uh, our second child, our son, was born in 1987. From 1990, 91, I suggested to my wife, I said, maybe we should go for the third child. She said, no, 
Ewe is our third child. Forget it. <laughs> so actually, that's how it, it is. We never had another child because the amount of travel I was doing, particularly to Armenia, made it impossible. And what I'm saying is that if you really get engaged from diaspora in a serious project that has serious benefits to Armenia, uh, you really need to invest time and effort. Uh, however, the end result, if you are successful, can be a lot more rewarding than anything, anything you can achieve in your professional or volunteer work abroad. So it is worth it to do it, even if it changes your life and, and so you, it forces you to invest lots and lots of energy and time into it. I would recommend it. Thank you, Alman. David? Let me come maybe from the other side of the same story. I made my move. I came back to Yerevan, and from Yerevan, I came to Stepanakert, and I guess I'm going to stay some time here. But I don't get reality. So it, it does test as like opportune point in my career. I am starting my third career in my life, being a laser physicist, being a UN diplomat or official. Now I'm starting as a government official in Artsakh. And I mean, I could do this because I retired from the UN and this is like interesting opportunity, professionally interesting opportunity. But I know for many, this is not the time or there are many factors which will not allow this to happen. So that's why I'm still thinking we need to be open and we need to try to engage as much as possible the potential of Armenian nation and the potential, I mean, it's not about just sending the money to Himnagram or to whatever, but intellectual resources, networks, connections, ideas, etc. This is all the collective might of Armenian nation. Once I try to estimate, like, what is the global contribution of Armenians in the world GDP? So if today's Armenia GDP is $15 billion, collective Armenians GDP around the globe is around 150 to 200 billion dollars. So we are, as economic power, the nation around the world is much bigger than our mean economy of today. And how this turned into benefit? And it is a benefit not just for Armenia, but it is for the Armenian nation. Because for me, we together, and this is like a multiplying effect, together we are stronger. And this is not just Armenia need diaspora, but diaspora also need Armenia because of identity, because of networking with each other, because of helping and supporting each other. So this is, I call it global network nation. And 21st century is probably the time when this type of networks will get a momentum, will get new developments, and will get new economic meaning. And this is what we need to try to advocate also. And for me, this is the, the, the approach I'm trying also to uh, apply for the realities here in Artsakh. Today we had a very engaged discussion with one of my AUA classmates who is based in New York, who is uh, one of the best HR managers I know about HR modernizing the human resource management system in the government of Artsakh. Very engaged, very interesting ideas, and he contributed remotely, and there was no like cost implied traveling or spending some time cutting from his own main job, whatever. So at the same plus on top of this, the world is connected. If before physically, and this is, I'm not saying this because I feel that what Armand Terkurian said is not important. Yes, it is important to come to the rules, to feel, to get this idea, and I'm really enjoying the food here, the talk here, the language, I mean, the, everything, the, the nation, Armenianness here now. But at the same time, in the modern world, 21st century, and especially in COVID and post-COVID, where we learn to interact and add value through virtual connections, like current conversation we're having, we don't need to physically bring all these people together. But there are many, many ways to bring ideas close to where they are needed, it, it could be, I don't know, for now, this is for me a big priority, humanitarian assistance to those displaced, to the families of victims, so the soldiers, uh, this is soldiers, whatever, then to 
help to recover Artsakh, help to recover Armenia psychologically, mentally, and economically, and then move to the next step and try to turn this, uh, like the, what we, some people call it defeat, some people would call it a, as a big lesson. So for me, it is a lesson, a painful, painful lesson. As a nation, we failed somewhere and we need to find a way. And I think the diaspora input into this, again, more intellectual, but also uh, financial, whatever, whatever, but also empathy, so, I mean, uh, t t discussions and helping each other to understand how we can come out of this. And I don't mean the political part of this conversation. It is more the social networking part to think together, to discuss together and build professional networks. Like I know um, American Association of Medical Doctors, for Armenian Medical Doctors is very actively engaged. Armenian uh, I mean, American Armenian Scientists and Engineers Association is discussing about possibility of engagement. American Armenian Bar Association and many professional networks and maybe an element of this network are physically in Armenia or in Arsakh, but many are outside and many are uh, holding uh, knowledge, expertise, skills which are needed here. So this is the way we need to construct the new approach to the global nation and collectively try to find the solution as a nation and as a state. Thank you. All right, now let's imagine uh, somebody on the other side. In other words, uh, you know, uh, let's say newly appointed uh, government official in Armenia, Artsakh. Um, uh, should uh, that person immediately think about engaging people from diaspora? Should they wait for someone to get in touch? And again, diaspora is you know not homogenous, so people are different. She may get, let's say, uh, lots of pitches. How to decide which ones worth even discussing and which ones not? And and um, do you have any advice on that? Um, first, uh, now that we are in the middle of this discussion, I want to congratulate David. Uh, uh, he is doing the ultimate, okay, having okay. gained uh, a, a lot of experience abroad, uh, experience that is quite relevant to the current situation in Artsakh and Armenia. He's, uh, he's gone back. Uh, I don't think he's gone back for the salary. Uh, uh, so it's uh, uh, really, uh, we are all very proud of you, David. And we're also proud of uh, Mane and Billia. We're proud of uh, the new uh, human rights uh, uh, officer in, um, uh, in Karabakh. I can't remember his name, who's also one of our graduates. Uh, so it's very, very rewarding to see that uh, there are several AUA graduates at, in Karabakh. Uh, helping the situation, working for the government uh, there. So, David, uh, congratulations, and um, and and we are proud of you. Um, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for diaspora Armenian projects, particularly those in business domain, that in my opinion are extremely important now, and I'm saying this because. I hear there's a lot of sentiment for leaving the country. And the only way you can keep people in Armenia is by creating good jobs. Uh, so uh, the, there, there are a, a couple of very important necessities. First, these government people that uh, were mentioned by Armin, um, I think they should make sure that the laws and regulations in Armenia are for, for investment, particularly for investment by individuals from abroad, as for Armenians included, should be crystal clear, transparent, and accessible. That is in several languages. People from diaspora going to invest in Armenia should have a very clear idea as to what the laws are. And the government has a responsibility in making those laws clear, crystal clear, transparent, and accessible. Second, no 
corruption or bribe, bribery should be allowed. Uh, we all know that this is a very tough area. Progress has been made in the past two, three years. Courts should address any legal problem promptly and within the confines of the laws. Unfortunately, examples where good intentioned diasporans went in there to start businesses and they got into all kinds of shady deals and, uh, uh, and they were surprised by the laws or lack of laws. So these things are things that the Armenian government should uh, do to, um, to facilitate this involvement, particularly in the business investment from abroad. On the other hand, I think diaspora Armenians should not expect special treatment. Some of them think that because they're Armenian and they are there with the intention of helping, that the rules and laws should be bent to benefit them. Absolutely not. I think they should not, diaspora should not expect special treatment. Um, I think there should be a mechanism for the diaspora specialists, now I'm talking about specialists, people who are uh, really uh, specialists in finance and sciences, in uh, diplomacy, in different fields, uh, they should somehow be uh, known to the Armenian government. Maybe the, the High Commissioner Office for Diaspora Affairs should, uh, I, I, I believe they are doing this, collecting and documenting expertise abroad. They, these specialists should be prepared to visit Armenia with no expectation. I really sincerely believe that visiting Armenia is essential for diaspora. If they haven't been there, they haven't seen it, it's very difficult for them to make sense out of it. I believe specialists can be helpful in Armenia if they really understand the country from within. Sitting abroad and giving advice is not effective even in the age of zoom you need to walk the streets of the Erevan. you need to see the people as they live as they work you need to enter the government offices and see how the government functions i'm not saying that these people should move to armenia in fact as you probably are aware the high commissioner for diaspora affairs has a program called i courts where they invite specialists from abroad to repatriate at least for a year or two to Armenia. And there are a number of them. There are 30, 40, 50 people that have been successful to, to attract. This is an excellent idea. I really like it. But it really engages younger people, which is very good, young people going there. But we, uh, other than young people, we also need to have more mature specialists uh, in their 50s, 60s. These are people that really cannot move to Armenia, leave their positions here and move to Armenia indefinitely or for very long periods of time. So how do you engage these kinds of people? Um, I'm, I'm saying these kinds of specialists should visit Armenia frequently and for, for significant periods of time, maybe two weeks, a month, well planned with lots of interaction with the local people. In order to uh, understand uh, the country and to identify counterparts with whom they can work even after they come back. I think that these, in my view, are necessary. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think the Armenian government would be wise to tap onto the vast array of specialists in the diaspora in diverse fields, such as diplomacy, finance, science, education, engineering, and other fields, um, in the government as advisors and other roles, except for the early years of Levantev Petrosian's government. This has not happened. Um, we have practically no examples of uh, high level specialists serving, living in the US or moving to Armenia, serving in high positions in the government as uh, not necessarily as ministers or government officers, but as advisors, as technocrats. 
Um, and uh, I, to, to make this happen, I think, again, it's very important that these specialists be paired with local specialists in similar fields with whom they can collaborate. So these are my thoughts in, in this respect. Thank you, Thank you Armen. David? Thanks. Let me compliment our men. And again, we are building on each other. And in fact, when you said about the Artsakh government also, today I had a very engaged, good meeting with discussion with the foreign minister, David Babayan, another AUA graduate, very friendly and I, I collegiality. <laughs> collegiality came also from the roots we share from AUA and the background and stuff like this. But maybe on a broader note, for me, I have a bit of identity crisis right now when I'm talking because I don't know where do I belong to. I'm now a government official already one week old in Artsakh. I'm, I grew up in Yerevan. My family lives in California. One more, my, my son lives in Seattle. I spent some days here in New York, whatever. So I feel today I was discussing with Chief of President Staff, Artak Begari, and I said, I feel I'm the bridge. I'm the connector. I need to try to find a language to connect all different parts of Armenians around the world because to some extent I have a language which the other side could understand, including I'm learning the language of Karabakhi Armenians also with some sort of nuances. And this is part of the role which I have taken for myself. Coming back to your question, Armen, again, how do we start, how the government officials should start? And this is me here a week already old government official and one of the first things I started with talking to my friends and the friends in different parts of US and elsewhere also Armenians who have interests to contribute to advise to brainstorm to talk about different let's say changes and arrangements we need to do together and this is and I was frankly surprised I mean, let me give this reflection also when I arrived to Yerevan on March 5th, and before that, for a few months, I was observing Armenia from Facebook, I felt I was a bit scared to come back to Yerevan. I felt that there's something post-war trauma, PTSD type of, which made a big portion of the nation crazy. And I was, I'm sincere about this. When I came back, I discovered that this craziness maybe belongs to some 10% of the population. I discovered huge, like potential interest, I mean, bright ideas, uh, some called the personality of Armenian nation on many, many different subjects. And then when the people were finding me, they say, ah, you, we know that you plan to go to Arsa. What about we try this about education? What about we try this about healthcare system? What about we try this about institutions? What about we try this about doing this for the kids for whatever, kindergarten, etc., etc. So I had maybe about 50 different interactions and each interaction was opening one more interaction to another group of the people. So this type of bottom-up network professionals talking to each other, trying to find solutions and then try to later institutionalize these solutions. I feel that I somehow happen to be in the middle of many streams coming together and to the extent to what extent I will be able to process all these streams into some productive direction which helps today's because people are suffering people are in need of many different at least 8,000 displaced partly in Armenia now partly here and the government of Armenia plans to construct I don't know six or seven thousand houses for them but it's not just a house issue it is about the jobs, it is about new structure of economy, they lost almost a big part of the power generation because hydropower energy is lost. So whether it should be solar energy or whether it should be new power, uh, hydropower, uh, agricultural land has been lost. So many things have been lost, but partly I think again, to me, it is a part of our how to build more effective, more productive economy in Artsakh and also in Armenia. And this is what we need to talk together because yes, challenges sometimes break us, sometimes make us stronger. <laughs> so how we can make this uh, unfortunate realities of the last year into the lesson which helped us to become stronger and to attend the next challenges which will surely come with a better might and with better solutions. 
Yeah, you are right, David. Uh, you have multiple. You've been. A, you've had. You wore multiple hats at different points, and now you're kind of. You've been on all sides of this equation, and um, that gives you some advantage, I think. Like you described, you were tapping into, you know, your network of friends and, and, and colleagues, former colleagues, and things like that. But not everyone has that, right? So I was thinking, just as a, you know. There is this idea of, say, well, you know, in, in U.S., for example, in many places, there are, like, in education in particular, there are things called advisory boards. Mm -hmm. right? So these are basically people who are professionals. They don't work for the place. They don't pay by the place. Once in a while, they get together with top people and they discuss things and provide their perspective free. Sometimes, most of the time, they actually pay to the university <laughs> to be on the board. Mm -hmm. um, so... Something along those lines, I think, you know, Armenia may, may need me. All right. Um, all right, let's focus on uh, kind of short term now. So what do you think are the key areas where diaspora should focus its efforts and where it can make the biggest uh, contribution, the biggest change in the next, let's say, I don't know, year, or I don't know what the short term is, but... Uh, Armin. You are talking about key uh, areas in terms of uh, key projects for Armenia? Or? Um, I'm skipping actually one thing. If you want to talk about key components of success, let's talk about that. Well, I felt that you already talked about it. Yeah, well, yes, you're right. I. Uh, did uh, mention uh, a couple of them. I'll repeat them, uh, the key components. Uh, as I mentioned, the project has to respond to a genuine need in Armenia. If there's no need, I don't think uh, the project will succeed. The project must have dedicated local collaborators. Uh, again, I think this is essential for a, a diaspora and prod initiative to succeed. Two more, um, I think the project must have financial sustainability if it involves, I assume most projects involve money, but there has to be a, at least plan how we're going to pay for it. Even if, if you don't have the money in advance for the project, you have to have a plan as to how you're going to raise, maybe based on initial success, initial results, you can then get, gain more funds. But you have to have a plan on financial sustainability of a project like this. Uh, with uh, a small fraction of the money you start and then you forget about it, uh, it's going to die. The other is that projects should be institutional projects should not be dependent on one or two persons. Uh, it may start like that, but then you want to institutionalize so that even if you leave the project stays. For example, TUMO is a good example of a one-man operation, Sam Simonian, but I think he has institutionalized uh, TUMO. Uh, he has made sure that there are funds behind it, there are endowments for it, and there's an infrastructure for it. There, there are people working there. There's a structure for visitors, for um, the people going and teaching there that goes beyond his personal involvement. So I think uh, this institutionalizing the project is a very important uh, aspect if it is going to be long-term and benefit Ar Armenia in a significant so those four components, I would say, are essential components for a diaspora project to succeed. All right, thanks. David? Let me reflect on the same set of issues from a different perspective. I view there are two blocks of issues we need to address. One is immediate aftermath we still unfortunately are struggling with this the time of turbulence the time of suffering 
after the war. And to me, there are two key issues which we as the nation need to find solution. Uh, first is the families of four deceased soldiers. And I'm also very, I was proud to be offered to become a board member of thousand plus foundation also and try to find solution from them. And second also the all the displaced people from the war. Because these two groups of people, I mean the families and the those displaced, they took the worst hit. They suffered the most. And this in my mind I associate that if for example my brother or my close relative goes to war to protect my family also and unfortunately things happen to him and I'm left with two families, whether I will take care for them or not, I think I should. If this is my brother's family, this is some other family, but we as the nation that need to take care for those fallen or for those who suffered the worst. So this is important for our identity also. If we don't provide and we need to find proper mechanism to address and to support them, and then so, but this is a short term. For now, and things are happening here and there, I feel that there is more or less attention given to those issues and we probably need to separately discuss each of them and what practically we need to do. Then comes long term. Rebirth, recreate, reestablish the identity of the nation, the trust into our future. Today, in fact, I mean, two days ago, I gave the interview to the uh, Aparash newspaper of Dashna Tsitsum party. When they approached me for the interview, I felt that they are going to get me into some political trap with some nasty questions about the politics either here in Armenia, but it turned to be a very decent conversation, which I concluded myself saying that she, she asked me, after such a trauma, do you still believe in the future? I said, the fact I'm here, it means that I'm here with you to build this future. And I indeed believe in the future for Artsakh and for Armenia. And we need to make an effort. So what type of engagement we need to have? This is type of longer term project. I mean, TUMO is one side. Armen, what you said about universities, board, professors. I have a friend who has a great idea to teach our kids to dream, to dream about the big things, to, to, to dream to become, I don't know, scientists, astronauts, I don't know, explorers, whatever. Somehow, we don't have enough role models for the kids in the villages to dream about the bigger life beyond. And if we all Armenians stop dreaming from the young ages, I don't think we'll become enough innovative and creative when we grow up. So this is, again, the change starts from kindergarten or probably earlier from the families and goes to universities and even on the job training. How to reorganize or recreate the nation as a new, a better quality, let's say, structure. And this is a bit longer discussion, and each of us probably has something to contribute to this, but this is indeed, to, I view again, diaspora and Armenia, these are not like one way process, diaspora come and help to Armenia. Diaspora and Armenia as one united global entity, connected with the sprouting networks of many professional people who care about each other, getting together and working together, and together creating higher value, co 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 trying to synergize on the advantages on both sides, and positioning Armenia around the, and Armenians around the world in a different league of the nations. All right, David, thank you. Uh, Armen, do you want to chime in on these uh, uh, short-term kind of yes. challenges, long-term uh, hopes? Yes, um, I, I second what David said. Short-term, certainly uh, the situation with uh, the, the hostages, the, uh, the POWs that are not returned, uh, the families, uh, from Karabakh who are homeless now, um, and uh, certainly uh, support for the families. In fact, here in San Francisco, we have uh, a concerted effort to support the Insurance Foundation for servicemen. We believe these families uh, need to be supported. So those are certainly short term, uh, maybe a bit long, longer term is diplomacy in uh, in securing an acceptable uh, 
political solution to the Karabakh issue. Uh, but uh, longer term, th those are sort of aftermath of the war, and I think David uh, described them well, so I will not repeat. But in terms of long term, long, short and long term uh, institutions that will support Armenia and diaspora collaboration, as mentioned, laws and regulations in Armenia for investment by individuals from abroad should be crystal clear, transparent, and accessible. Um, I think that we need to establish what I would call International Armenian Science Foundation Fund, some kind of a fund um, for, to foster and fund research and possibly education projects by Armenian scientists worldwide possibly in collaboration with non-Armenian colleagues in similar fields. Uh, um, it, this would be essential. Uh, you can imagine physicists, Armenian physicists in Armenia, Russia, and US collaborate on a project, possibly engaging some non-Armenian scientists funded by an international Armenian Science Foundation fund. Uh, there is a good example for this, something similar. It's called U.S.-Israel Binational Science Foundation. Can you imagine the U.S. government and the Israeli government put money into funding uh, science projects in Israel? Why can't we do that? Uh, and in fact, engage scientists, I mean scientists all over. I think we, another uh, idea would be to create and consolidate worldwide Armenian trade professional associations, similar to the Science Foundation, but broad, more broad. For example, uh, Armenian Science Association, Association of Physicists, Chemists, you know, Scientists, Armenian Bar Association that already exists, but broaden that, engage uh, lawyers, uh, attorneys from other countries, Armenia, as a consolidated, unified organization. Armenian Medical Association that already exists, uh, AES Armenian Engineers and Scientists of American, uh, Association of Armenians in High Tech, um, Armenian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'm thinking of these being consolidated worldwide associations, engaging also specialists in Armenia in their ranks. These organizations could play a significant role in organizing meetings, providing advice, offering training and mentoring of young people, uh, uh, reviewing research and development projects, uh, and advocating for Armenia. So, you know, these things exist, but, you know, there's a medical association in France, uh, there's one in the US. I would like this to consolidate and become powerful international organization. Um, another idea would be to establish laws in Armenia for setting up endowments. Uh, and perhaps Armin, you are uh, someone that can consult being in finance. How does Armenia set up endowments? This is essential for sustainability of projects. You know, diaspora in Armenia is go there, help a school, renovate a school with toilets, classrooms, this and that. Two years later, they go, it's in a state of despair and they get very discouraged. I think when you build something like this, and we do this in AUA, when you build something, you put aside some money in an endowment to pay for the upkeep maintenance of that facility, that laboratory, whatever it is. It is very discouraging for diasporans to pay for it, and then they go and two years later, they are disappointed. Point is that anything like this requires money to maintain and upgrade. So um, AUA, one of the best things AUA did was to set up an endowment. And probably today combined between the UC endowment and the HB endowment is a hundred million dollars. Can imagine this, is a significant portion of the annual budget. 
And that is how the university is institutionalized, how it is sustained. It doesn't depend on one or two donors to come and rescue, although donors have given it to this endowment to make it possible. Finally, I think there has to be a mindset in Armenia for merit-based advancement in education, work, public service, and other spheres of act, human activity. We all know about you know, this should not be the criterion for getting jobs or advancing in jobs or getting education, being admitted uh, in universities. We need to, it's, it's, I know it's a small country, it's very difficult to do this, but we have to find ways where advancement is merit-based. That will assure quality and uh, uh, advancement in all fields, including the government. Uh, those, I th think, are things that need to be institutionalized in Armenia to benefit from, to, to allow effective diaspora Armenia interaction on projects and uh, uh, initiatives. All right, thank you. Thank you, Arman. I think you are right. All these, uh, you know, it's important to put all our efforts together together we can do more it's important to institutionalize and make sure things can continue be sustainable david you want to add anything on this institution yes, a, a couple, long -ground of, stuff? A couple of points i think in addition to the because the net first the relations the professional touch knowledge added value and all is great and we spoke about this from different perspective but there's also a very important to me part which is the emotional touch or empathy to the realities here and i want to elaborate a bit armen you were with me in this project adopt a refugee family yes there was this place and many of my classmates and friends etc contributed and we tried to personalize it was not just abstract problem of homeland with where your grandparents coming from but it is a very personalized family beautiful family not very beautiful but emotionally touchy stories which help people hearts moving and try to find like say support to a real people with their real problems and i think the and i'm discussing there's this idea that the new organization which is they are going to launch soon they call it re armenia and this is about trying Trying to create, in addition to individual family stories, maybe individual community, village story in Artsakh. This is the community, this is the landscape, this is the, I don't know, the tasty food, this is the beautiful mountains, this is the healthy air, this is whatever, and these are the good people living on this land. And so what they need, I don't know, a smart farm or, I don't know, good education, they have smart kids, they look for the future, and they try, and then the re Armenia guys, they are super professional on the crowdfunding, and they are trying to, we are trying to design some new modern schemes, how this arrangement, so it could be a very specific project for a village, it could be a business project, I don't know, producing wine, or producing the, I mean, the, the the, the uh, Artsakh vodkas, whatever, from Mulberry or whatever, or it could be that special herbs or whatever, the dry food, etc. But it could be business, it could be culture oriented, it could be some human family story oriented, but emotionally connect, empathy wise con to connect, to create a story around this to build a bit more. Because yes, Professional networks to me is one part of the equation, but this connecting to the homeland has a very also emotional touch and try to build around this emotional touch, more connection, more human relations, and eventually help people here and for those who are outside. And I know many of those who are outside and they call me, many of them, I had good phone conversation. For them, they really want to help, but they don't know the, 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 the channels. What is the trusted channel to help? And sometimes we have challenges with the channels, but the, there are people who need help and there are people who can help. And to find the right bridge of connecting, 
I think this is a very important role which I'm trying to play and will be very happy if my uh, the, 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 the universe of alumni of AUA also will be helpful in this. So let's together try to find the, the systems which help people to regain trust that institutions in Armenia, in Artsakh can be trusted. When some people tell me about corruption, I'm telling them, tell me about corruption after I spent three years in Afghanistan or four years in Somalia or three years in Syria. I mean, the, the cosmic magnitude of corruption there, there's no comparison to the one. But yes, within even in those war systems, we managed to build the systems which people trusted. The donors trusted, the, the others trusted. So it is possible to build some direct connection, to build the professional touch, to rebuild the emotional touch, and to build the trust between the two parts of Armenian community and to make sure that we find the way to each other. All right, David. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to ask you one question about the uh, diaspora itself. We kind of assume that diaspora exists and will exist on its own. Uh, you know, we talk about things that diaspora may do in Armenia. Does diaspora need some kind of maintenance? Uh, do you think the institutions that diaspora has will ensure the sustainability of diaspora itself for Armenia and for itself? And, and what, what's the role of Armenia to, to, for the future of diaspora also? Armen. Well, uh, I think if we are honest, it's only a rather small fraction of diaspora that is engaged with Armenia, to be honest. Um, of course, uh, at, uh, at times, say, right during the war and after the war, maybe for a while, that percentage may have been larger. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it is not a big chunk of diaspora. I don't know. I, I cannot um, give, put a number on it. But just uh, observing my own communities, the, the environment that I am familiar with, it is um, a fraction of the diaspora that is engaged with Armenia. And th th there is also the, uh, assimilation is, is a big issue. Uh, some Armenian schools uh, in Los Angeles area have closed in recent years. If you look at the number of Armenian going to Armenian school, Ar Armenian kids, it's a, again, it's, well, it's a surprisingly small percentage. Something like only 10% of Armenian kids go to Armenian schools. It's the vast majority are not going to Armenian. So assimilation and intermarriage and gradual dilution is going to happen. But I think the core uh, stays there regardless of whether they speak Armenian or not. Um, if yeah, we all so know one thing, diasporans who happen to visit Armenia for a while, it becomes, in, for many of them, a life-changing experience. So we should really facilitate this idea of having diaspora, particularly the young people. The younger uh, they, they visit, the better it is. Uh, and I think that builds the connection uh, really well. Uh, but very long term, I don't know. We, we, uh, we survived. I'm from Iran. We survived there for 400, 500 years, uh, but uh, it was a different context. It was a, a, a Islamic country. We were treated and we felt as a separate minority, but that is not the case in the West. Uh, many in the West are more easily absorbed in the, uh, the Christian or the Western uh, environment probably even in some ways superior to the Armenian experience. So the, uh, the danger is always there in the West. And, uh, but, but I think a core will stay at least for 
100 years, I don't know. Um, so that's how I, I see it. Uh, uh, it is inevitable that a big chunk of it will just disappear. All right. Thank you, Armin. David, you have thoughts? Uh, yes. I mean, there is a trend and which is unfortunate and, and this is the reality. So probably oh, we will live through this, but at the same time, not necessarily the outcome is given. And for me, I mean, the first, of course, example comes the Jewish nation, which has been surviving or existing 2000 years without the statehood and with ever never being uh, known as a strong warriors being massacred in unimaginable quantities by the Nazi Germany. And suddenly they recreated the nation, they collected the Jews around the world. And then like in six, 70 years from then, they became one of the big powers in the world. So they like brought in 1 million Jews from the Soviet Union, 800,000 from Middle East, retrained, re-educated, taught the language, organized, whatever. And somehow it became like a strong, modern nation. So meaning, yes, there is a trend, there is a tendency. And from the figures, I know what Armen, you said also that, for example, to Himnadram during the war, there are 250,000 contributions. Uh, I don't know whether it includes Armenian contributions from Armenia also or not, but this is a fraction only of seven or eight million diaspora we are talking about. And so half of the contributions, I guess, came from Armenia, half from outside. So it means only a few percentage of our mind, Armenian diaspora, even during the war, played some role trying to contribute to this. So again, this is not a scientific figure, and I don't, know, don't want to draw too far reaching conclusions on this, but that is, that's the reality. And there's a role which we collectively probably to, to try to play, try to recreate, reinvent the identity, the image, the nation. And uh, again, back to the Jewish example of Israel, it is possible and this is up to us to accept this or to try to change it. All right, so we got one question on chat. Let's ask that and then we'll wrap it up. The question is for David actually, and the question uh, reads, what is the biggest challenge David sees in his work in Artsakh? I mean, there's no one single challenge. Of course, we all know this very special configuration. Security is outsourced to the Russian peacekeeping forces. Um, economic, let's say, or humanitarian support is mostly outsourced to the Armenian state budgets, and so it will be heavily subsidize the budget here and all the humanitarian needs, at least a plan for, from, to attend from Armenia. So, but at the same time, to me, there is a population here. There are different estimates from 60,000 to 100,000. People are here, people are on the ground and people want to see a future. The future, of course, I mean, very hard to predict in five years from now whether the Russian peacekeepers will continue. I believe they will continue staying. I believe there will be, Armenia will be able to restart its own identity and then Artsakh also. But yes, I mean, the quality of economy of Artsakh to me and, the, and the, the, to rebuild the identity of the people here, try to find what type of economy Artsakh need to have, what type of agriculture work need to have, what type of processing uh, uh, economy it need to have and attract investment, which will come with certain risks, but it, 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 this is still possible. So it's not a totally lost game. It is a very high risk game, which I'm also part of the game now. I bet on this, on the victory, on the, not military victory, but on the victory as a nation, as a state, as Artsakh, and will try to do my best, but it is uh, just, I'm just one week old here, so I need a bit more time and to tell maybe what will be the first key priorities, which as administration, as a part of administration, I'll try to push forward. But to me, the big one, uh, important big challenge I forgot to mention is this dependency on humanitarian assistance could become an issue. And I've seen this in Syria, in Afghanistan, after the earthquake in Armenia, when people start getting free food parcels and free cash benefits, it helps for a few months and then people get used. That someone needs to pay their bills and they are, let's say, 
uh, uh, accommodating to this reality and they stop, stop producing, stop creating, stop working and then it is what is going to kill the nation. If we, we have to be smart enough, so from humanitarian, moving recovery and moving development, to me, this is the big, to me, important challenge, which I'll try to make my own push as much as I can. Thanks. Uh, we, got, we got another question. So let's, <laughs> uh, we didn't have many, so I'm gonna read this too. Um, do you think key Armenian organizations in the diaspora should start having repatriation as part of their main goals? How can Armenia promote mass mass repatriation? What do you think, Arvin? Well, I personally think repatriation is great. Uh, and uh, I have met many, many tens of uh, repatriated uh, Americans, American Armenians, Canadian Armenians, European Armenians. And I must say they love it. They are enjoying their lives. And they're having productive lives. They're raising families there. Uh, and it's not like a, a torture chamber they go. No, they are enjoying what they're doing. Uh, it gives them uh, meaning to their lives. And, um, as I mentioned, uh, the High Commissioner's Office for Diaspora Affairs has a program for repatriation. I think that is a good mechanism. And I think uh, I agree with uh, Rita Keshkishian that organizations in the diaspora should also encourage that, facilitate that. If, if at all possible, because uh, it will strengthen the homeland and people are making choice on their own. It's not a forced thing. And our observation is that those who do that have a very uh, uh, enjoyable life there. They have a uh, meaningful life. And by the way, we, we are both places. We have built a new nice apartment and we spent a part of uh, the year there. Our son was there for four or five months and he wants to go back again soon. And uh, uh, so I think uh, repatriation is, uh, uh, should be encouraged and should be facilitated as much as possible. Not forced, but there's no need to force people. Those who do, they enjoy. David? That's my opinion. Um, yes, I think, I mean, we need all to do the maximum to make it coming because um, people have their own lives, they have their own environment, they exist, they have their job, so it's not easy for all of them to do this. And unfortunately, we lost two waves of possibilities of migrating to Armenia. One was the Armenians from Baku, Azerbaijan, who came mainly through or Yerevan and Armenia, and they went to elsewhere to Canada, US, etc. And then the next wave was the Syrian Armenians. Some of them came to Armenia, but many of them went to Europe and elsewhere also. So uh, it, we didn't build on this, but still, I think, yes, Repat Armenia, and there are a number of organizations. I don't know how many is the number of how many actually the expat or diaspora grown Armenians came and found their new life in Armenia. I know few, but I don't have the figure. But for example, those who are talking like myself, I came and I started working like my third career, but those who want to retire in a beautiful place with a great food, with like very safe environment and very nice conditions of living and but cheaper than elsewhere. So my, my guesstimate is like 50,000 Armenians who are retiring in the Western world could find very decent high quality life in Armenia, plus very healthy food are comparable with the food in the US and the, the nature and many other things. So this is the young Armenians also who are entering the professional life. It's not that easy to jumpstart professional career, but it could be opportunity, internships and many other things. So there are different segments of Armenian diaspora community, which could find different openings. Some could come to start a business, some could come for other reasons, etc. So there will be, and people, I think there should be some adjustment in the realities in Armenia also, the way we welcome to Armenia, the diaspora Armenians. So giving them instantly the citizenship upon the arrival, incorporating, integrating, 
giving whatever, I mean, we, the Armenia is not a rich nation, so there's not much we can offer in like more monetary terms, but at least what could be done by law or by changing the constitution, all these things need to be adjusted to allow the Armenians who want to be in Armenia to give them all possible means to come. Armin, may I make a comment? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, David talked about uh, uh, retired and senior people. I have a business idea. Uh, I'm not a businessman myself, <laughs> but maybe uh, some of our alumni are in this business. A really, really good business in Armenia would be top-notch quality senior homes. You know, there are thousands of Armenians in the U.S. who get $3,000, $4,000 from Social Security with that per month. With that money, they cannot, they have miserable life in, in the U.S. Trump, Trump. Imagine these people moving to Armenia. You have a nice building, high quality with good nurses, good entertainers, good uh, guides. Take them around the country, give them good food, Give them enjoy, you know, good weather, good uh, scenery. Uh, it would be a fantastic uh, uh, business. You know, imagine if they have three thousand dollars a month to spend in Armenia. That's an enormous amount of money. You could give them all kinds of benefits. Mm -hmm. Quality of life there for these people would be enormous. Now, of course, they are not ones to go fight for Armenia or to start businesses. But money will come and it'll create jobs. They will be happy in Armenia and they will add to the Armenian economy. So senior homes is a fantastic business opportunity in Armenia. All right. Yeah. I think uh, I, I think our alumni should should consider that as a business um, proposition. All right, guys. Uh, I want to thank uh, Armen Terkurian and David Takopian for participating um, in this webinar. I want to thank everyone else who participated um, and listened and asked questions. I want to thank also the AUA alumni office who organized this and Narenka and Narina personally who, who uh, helped us make this happen. All right. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Armen. Thank you.